right, hi everyone. So with Kiran just having explained all the basics of assembly, I would now like to take you on a trip and explore low level assembly and threading in David. Now, what was David again? So in early 2018, the Alliance of Open Media released AV1. We all remember that. Now, whenever a new codec comes about, the following thing happens. Content makers really want to stream it, or at least we hope they will. But they can't because nobody supports it. There's no hardware devices and so on. Um, because of that, there's no content being streamed in that format. And if there's no content being streamed, then for hardware makers, there's not really any incentive to include support for that new format in their next generation of devices either. So you have the circular dependency and you're essentially stuck. This can slow or even stall adoption of this new codec. And that sucks for us technologists. So the broad David as a way to work around this. The idea is that we write a production grade decoder that is good enough for certain use cases, not everything, but some. And that allows content makers to start streaming content in this new codec. Because of that, we've now unclogged this uh, circular dependency. And hardware makers will hopefully include support for this new codec in their next generation of devices. At some point, the software decoder becomes unnecessary, and we have the ideal world of hardware decoders alone. So we're not quite that useless yet, but where are we now? So where is David? Um, from a coding perspective, David is honestly mostly done. Um, on x86, we've optimized David for the SSSE3, AVX2, and AVX512 instruction sets. On ARM mobile devices, we've optimized David for the Neon instruction sets. If you add all of this up, we're talking about 220,000 lines of handwritten assembly. That's an enormous amount. That's more than FFmpeg. FFmpeg, all x86 and ARM assembly together is 160,000 lines of code, right? Or in other words, 90% of David's code base is assembly. It's essentially just a bunch of assembly with a tiny thin C wrapper around it. So if you want to understand how David works, we're going to have to look at assembly. So let's do that next. So the tool that I've chosen to study here is film grain synthesis. In film grain synthesis, we have um, a, block, a block of pixels, and we want to add noise to those pixels, right? Pseudo-random noise. Um, these pseudo-random noise values are scaled. Um, and the scaling, the scaling value depends on the intensity of the pixel value. The idea here being that you might want different levels of noise in bright versus dark portions of your frame. Um, that's the scaling lookup that you see here. This is particularly difficult to implement in SIMD. Um, so let's see how we solve that. Um, we'll start by looking at the SSSE 3 version, right? SSSE 3 is old, um, your mom's laptop, your grandma's laptop supported this. Um, in this function, uh, the scaling table pointer is passed in the general purpose register R9. Uh, the Pixel source values themselves are unpacked from bytes to words, that's two byte elements, in 16-byte um, registers, XMM0 and XMM1. And then we do this weird thing where we unpack the pixels one by one in general purpose registers, R15 and R12. And then we do lookup tables one by one, and we insert them back in XMM12. Um, that's really weird, right? That's actually not SIMD. Meanwhile, we shift the pixel values and, you know, we do the same thing again. After this code block of 12 uh, instructions, we've done four pixel values, right? I said that the total register holds 16, so we repeat this another three times. And in total, it takes 46 instructions to do 16 uh, lookup values in the scaling table. Or, you know, uh, one metric of looking at this is three instructions of pixel, roughly. But this is not a real SIMD implementation. And the reason for that is SSSE3 does not actually implement an instruction to do this thing efficiently. So let's go on to AVX2. This gets better. In AVX2, again, the setup is that my uh, scaling pointer is in the general purpose register R9. My source pixels are in YMM0 and 1 as two byte words. And if I have a constant loaded in YMM8, then I can use this constant to split my source pixels in even and odd four byte D words. Um, then these D words, I can do a SIMD lookup on using the gather instruction. And that gives me a SIMD lookup 
of the scaling values in the destination registers. Um, four gather instructions in total. Now, you saw from the previous version, for the rest of the function that I didn't show, I would actually like them to be in two byte words, so I have to blend them together. And in total, to do the same as what I did previously, I now only need 14 instructions instead of 46 for a 32 byte wide register instead of a 16 byte wide register. So 14 divided by 32 is just under a half an instruction per pixel. Better, but not. Great, we can do much better than that. So let's go to AVX 512. In AVX 512, my registers are 64 bytes, right? They keep getting bigger. Now, since the lookup table itself is only six, uh, uh, 256 bytes, I can just as well preload the whole thing in four registers. Then I can use this magic instruction, vperm t2b or vperm i2b, which is essentially a shuffle, as you learned from Kiran, uh, between two of those registers using a seven bit index in the third source register. So this is a seven bit indexing shuffle and I only need eight bits, so I only have to do it twice. Once as if the highest bit was set and once as if it was not set. And then I can select between these two uh, using two more instructions or five instructions for 64 um, lookup uh, for the scaling, or under 0.1 instructions a pixel. So you can see here that the new instruction sets don't just give us wider registers, they actually give us new instructions that are particularly useful for video decoding. Um, looking at the clock cycle timings for these functions, right? how fast is the film grain synthesis function in a, in a benchmark in check ASM? Uh, we can see that each of the versions that I just mentioned is about two to three times as fast as the previous one. The most disappointing speed up is for AVX2, which is kind of funny because you know the, the, the number of instructions went down by a lot. The reason for that is that the gather instruction is um, particularly slow. Um, a particularly positive sign here is that the speed up from AVX2 to AVX512 is 3x. And that's fantastic because typically speaking, we see something like 1.3x for that. All right, so this is one function. David is a whole collection of those functions. Um, what's the total impact of these kind of assembly instructions on the coding time? So looking at a 4K 10-bit file here, um, if you use C decoding with all assembly turns off, um, you get about four and a half FPS, which is not very good. Auto vectorization doesn't particularly help. Uh, if you enable SSSE 3 or SSE 4 instructions, then you get 12 and a half to 15 FPS, which is better. AVX 512, 19 and a half FPS, or AVX 512, 21 FPS. Now, you might think 20 FPS, that sucks. I thought 4K was 60 FPS. Yes, but this is single threaded. So let's go to multi threading now. So David's multi threading is a, a task queue design. In, in a task queue design, you have different tasks. They have um, a type associated with them, and then a position and a set of dependencies. Um, examples of those tasks in David are a frame header reading, which produces the um, entropy state, and a dependency here is the input and entropy state of a reference frame. Then this entropy is used to do bitstream reading. Um, bitstream reading is done uh, for multiple tiles at the same time. Um, each of these tasks handle just one superblock row, and this task produces things like intraprediction modes, motion vectors, and uh, inverse transform coefficients. Once I've done that, then the next set of tasks, again, per tile, one superblock row at a time, is the actual block reconstruction. This does intraprediction, motion compensation, inverse transforms, right? All of those terms that we've heard before. Um, this creates the actual pixel values of the block reconstruction. And then after that, based on that block reconstruction, we can do a bunch of uh, post filters, in loop post filters like dblock, cdef, um, loop restoration, and an out loop post filter like uh, film grain synthesis. Um, each of those, again, operate one super blog row at a time. Um, we can have lists of tasks like that for multiple frames at the same time. And then the way the algorithm works is that you just have a bunch of um, runner threads, and each of these runner threads just iterates over this list of tasks and sees which one has a full set of satisfied dependencies. And if it finds a task, it will run it. When it's finished running it, it will um, increment the vertical position of that task and then reinsert that task back in the list. That's for you know, the neighboring superblock row below it. Um, Eventually, certain of these task types will complete and they're then removed from the task list. And once all of the tasks have completed, then waterfall style, your frame has magically finished the coding. So um, 
why do we do it this way? Um, the idea here is, first of all, to be very resource efficient. So um, um, you want to have a low number of uh, threads that keeps that number of cores exactly active uh, as efficiently as possible. That's also resource efficient because these threads have um, scratch memory associated with them. Um, Secondly, this does not rely on particular bitstream features. So regardless of what file you throw at it, it always works. And lastly, this works really well on combinations of big little cores, which are all the hype nowadays. So results, uh, this is on a different system than previously. So the results are slightly different. Uh, David, single thread at same file, about 22 FPS. If you do that for two threads, you see that we can keep two cores completely active, so 200% CPU usage, and we go to 40 FPS. Four threads, again, four cores completely active, 66 FPS, and eight threads, eight cores almost completely active, 88 FPS. So yeah, we can actually do software 4K 60, 10 bits HDR decoding in real time, which is pretty amazing. And then, you know, for comparison, Google's GF1 decoder, it gets to about 24 FPS. Uh, we can also do this for mobile. Um, on ARM, single threaded decoding difference is a little bit smaller, about 10%. But when you go to four threads, you can see that the difference grows to 35%. That 35% can be the difference between 540p or 720p. Or, you know, you just save some trees. You can also see that when the little cores come into effect, that's at eight threads, that our threading still scales up, whereas GFU1's threading collapses a little bit. Is anyone using this? Yes, everyone is using this. Honestly, you're probably using it, although you may not actually know, which was kind of the point. Uh, browsers use it. Um, media frameworks all over the place use it. Uh, some mobile applications that we all know and love, they use this too. And that means that we've sort of succeeded in a way, right? Like we've jump-started this ecosystem so people can adopt AV1. So that means that hardware support should be around the corner, right? And that's indeed the case. So hardware decoding is now essentially available in any high-end device that is coming on the market, um, including the iPhone. Yes. So at some point, nobody will really need David anymore. But that's a good thing. It means that AV1 is winning, right? Hashtag AV1. Um, and so that means that the next step is now on you, right? With AV1 winning, you should use AV1 too. Um, the ecosystem is out there, we're ready, right? Start streaming AV1. If you need a software decoder, please use David. If you feel that the open source encoders don't quite do it for you, um, maybe we can help you there too. We have a, a commercial encoder. But most importantly, let's give an applause to all the people that wrote David. They're on the left here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.